that didn't make it. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Christ Hope. We're so glad that you're here this morning for worship. If you are visiting, we extend a special welcome to you, and what we'd like you to do is connect with you by having you fill out a Tri-5 card. You'll find those throughout the room on the chairs, and as soon as the service is over, you can drop those off at the hub in the lobby. We have two missions announcements. The first is a Florida mission trip. It's the first week of June, and we want to gauge interest in that trip. So Josh will be at the hub after the service, and he will be glad to talk to you about what the details are to that trip. And then we're having a Florida Mission Banquet on May 5th. It's a Saturday at 6 p.m. There's more information at the Hub, and you can sign up there as well. And then April 27th, we're having another Worship Vocalist Workshop. That's 9 to noon. Be looking in the email this week for a link where you can sign up for that, and it's free. Oh, I'm sorry, Kirby. Can you fast forward a little bit? One more. Kate didn't do her job this morning. Great. Well, again, we're here for one reason, one reason only, that is to praise and worship our Heavenly Father. So if you can stand, let's begin in worship. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart but believe there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Yeah. Just one word, you heal what's broken inside. one word and you revive every dream just one touch I feel the power of heaven just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Come on now. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. 
we have a new song to teach you this morning. It's called Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. And the song just reminds us of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that our God is good, that his love is everlasting, and we can be with him for eternity. Let's learn this together. This morning, I want to read Matthew 26, 26 through 8, uh, 28. 
Uh, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Uh, with the baptism last week, uh, I was reminded uh, that Christ died for us uh, and personally for me uh, and each one of you. And uh, I thought maybe this would be a good time to talk about what communion really is. We, today we remember his death by taking the emblems of bread and the grape juice. Uh, the bread is an emblem of his body and the juice is an emblem of his blood. Uh, that which well, was, excuse me, that which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin, as mentioned in the verses I just wrote. But since Christ has died for us, uh, they are now emblems to remember his sacrifice uh, that was made for us in order to save us from our sin and to live eternal, as the song just said. Um, but how did his death cleanse us from our sins? This, uh, there's a song uh, called uh, uh, Whiter Than Snow. Uh, when I was a youngster, we sang that. Some of you may know it. Some of you may not. <laughs> uh, but I think it really gives us uh, an overview of what Christ did. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly re entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at your crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing, I see thy blood flow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, before you I patiently wait. Come now, and within me a new heart create. To those who has sought me, sought thee, uh, you, thou never say no. Uh, whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. The hope that we just sang about that springs eternal is the cleansing that we got, that we have through eternal life, through the sacrifice that Christ made for all of us. So this morning, as we take the bread and the juice, I pray that you will remember that sacrifice and what it really means for us as individuals. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are, because without your mercy and grace, uh, we would have no hope. But through the sacrifice that was made for us through your son, Jesus Christ, we have both hope and we have a future uh, that is beyond uh, imagination. Lord, as we take this, uh, these emblems this morning, I pray that you will touch our hearts, that you will open our minds uh, to uh, the sacrifice, uh, to Christ's life, uh, to the resurrection that we just celebrated here last week. And Lord, just what that has done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Hey, I'm curious, how many of you guys had a hard time finding your normal chair? <laughs> yeah, we, we made the room a little bit different because we're going to be focusing on something uh, pretty important. Uh, and so sometimes change has a way of doing that. But I, I got a kick out of Val. She came up to me and she said, it's like half of the church is trying to figure out where their usual seat is because we change things around. Well, my name is CJ. I'm the lead minister here at Christ Hope, and I'm glad you are joining us today. We are taking a break from our series that we've been going through in Acts, and we're starting a new series uh, called, uh, well, it's something that we do every year. We like to give it this, this pretty title, One Church. Uh, but usually what we do each year is we think about what is one thing that our church needs. What is one thing that from the bottom to top, from the center of the room to the wings of the building, what is it that our church desperately needs? And so every year we spend time trying to figure that out. And so we like doing things together. We believe that God does amazing things when we as a church rally together and ask him one big ask. You know, we ask God to move in one major special way. And, and we don't necessarily believe that God is hindered for the rest of the year until we do this again. But we do believe that there is something special about together as an entire church joining and intentionally preaching and teaching and studying and reading and praying about whatever that one big thing is. And so what it is this time around is technically today we are starting day one of a 40-day prayer journey. And our whole church is rallying together with this idea of prayer in mind and how important prayer is and how, how much it matters to God and his relationship with us, but also how it impacts our lives even on a practical level. And so we're beginning day one of this prayer journey using a companion uh, it's a book that some of you have already picked up at the Hub, and if you know nothing about it, you're welcome to visit the Hub after the service and ask the, the Hub person there about the book. It's called Draw the Circle, and it is written by Mark Batterson. But one thing you need to understand is, is that we are not replacing the Bible with Batterson. No, on the contrary, the reason we're using this book, as I said, it's meant to be a companion to help us lean harder into the Word of God, to dig deeper, to uh, glean from things on a daily devotional level. And so it's meant to help, but it is not meant to replace. Does that make sense? Uh, something about this book, Draw the Circle, uh, it may even raise alarm bells. I know some people look at that and they go, whoa, circles. That kind of sounds like a seance. What are we doing? What kind of church is this? And that's not at all the case. Uh, in fact, I, I've told people before, it's a little bit of a bummer that it comes so late in the book, but day 38, uh, Mark Batterson references Habakkuk 2.1 that has to do with uh, taking ourselves and positioning ourselves on the watchtower where we would have a space dedicated to be able to watch and observe, yet also intently listen. And so from this concept of drawing the circle, the, there is no power in the circle, okay? The only power is in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. However, we believe that there is something to having a special designated location, a designated space. You know, Jesus, when he would pray, he would withdraw to lonely places, uh, some of you may have, in your own homes, a prayer closet. Some of you may call it the war room. I know it got popularized by some Christian movie years ago. But one of the things that comes back to my mind as an example of what drawing the circle and praying in a circle really looks like is something that is very common to most of us. Many of you, at one point or another, and maybe even on a daily basis, join hands in prayer. And when you do, naturally... You create a circle, and sometimes I've seen people, when they join hands, they create a circle inwardly, 
And I've also seen other churches who thought, man, we want to pray for our community. We want to pray for our church. We want to pray uh, from the inside out. And so they face the opposite direction so that their prayers, even though they're in a circle, they're praying outwardly. But even on a very fundamental level, uh, there are countless families that still to this day value praying as a family. And so they sit at a dinner table and they hold hands together. And they pray. And so there is something about this idea. It's nothing to do with the physical uh, side of things in itself. It has more to do about the position of our hearts and our minds as we go to God in our prayers purposefully and intently. Now, I chose this book because I've read it before. And I, I don't know how long ago it was. But I'm pretty certain that it was sometime in 2017. So that's the year I'm going to give you, and and we're just sticking with that story. But sometime in 2017, I decided that I would embark on this 40-day journey myself. Uh, Back then, I was going through a hard time. I was having my own struggles, and so I decided that I would begin my 40-day prayer journey And it would go from the day I started at the end of the 40 days would be Easter. And I know we just came out of Easter, but that was my own personal decision that I wanted to be committed to an intentional and intense pattern of prayer, asking God for one big special thing. Now, like I said, I was in a rough spot back then. Uh, I was struggling. I had doubts and I had insecurities. And as they were creeping up, they were chipping away at my faith. And you might be surprised to hear that a preacher on Sunday would stand on a stage and talk about how he struggled in his faith. I mean, it's the center of my life. It is where everything flows out of that, that if I don't have God, if I don't have faith, I don't have anything. But what may not surprise you is that whether you are a veteran in your faith journey or you have served faithfully in your church for many, many, many years, or you have been a, just a, a volunteer who has been committed to the way that they serve, or you have even been a church leader, across the board, a phenomenon that happens right around the time when we are in our 20s and mid-20s is there is like this existential crisis that hits most people, and they start really struggling. And it's especially true among young people. And so I was not exempt from that. In my 20-somethings, I was really struggling. Is God really who I have always believed him to be? Or is all of this just made up to make me feel better about myself and my life and, and being comfortable with the impending march towards death? And so I committed, well, if, if God is who he claims to be and if he's who I believe him to be, then I'm going to take him at his word that he promises if I pray to him, he will hear me. And I would be so blessed, so graced, that he would not just hear me, but that he would actually respond. And so I trusted God on that. I took him up on that promise, that challenge, and I began praying diligently to God for 40 days in one of the stages of my faith where I felt at my lowest. Now what you should know about this prayer journey is that no matter where you are in your faith, this can be where you start. Uh, For a lot of us, when we think about prayer, we have to realize that as a church, with this being a one church series, we are all committing to heading the same direction. And though some of our prayers may differ from person to person on an individual level, the commitment in the heart is still there. And what you need to understand is that wherever you are in your faith journey, Jesus is there with you. So this might be your very first step. You might be a person who is coming into church, and and Jesus, God, the Bible, church, it may be entirely new to you. And you should know that Jesus is right there with you. For others, this may be just another day, and, and you have been doing this church thing all your life, And though some people are at the beginning of their starting line, you would probably say you're near closer to your finish line. But you should know that Jesus is right there with you. And you may find yourself somewhere in between, and Jesus is right there with you. And that is just the amazing thing about our God, is that he can meet us wherever we are, and that he is willing to travel with us. 
The reason I started this idea and why I want to start today as day one is because through this prayer journey, we are anticipating that God will not only hear our prayers, but that he would respond to them. And the first day of that devotional, if you've snuck a peek already, which I know some of you have done, uh, it's called Get Ready. Uh, some of you have done more than just sneak. Some of you started in chapter one, and I warned you, it's a page turner. And so you went, wow, I, I just have to read one more. I just got to read one more. Man, this is good. This is going to change my prayer life. I need to go one more. Some of you probably have already finished the whole book. But we're starting today at day one because I firmly believe that if we are going to go to God in faith, in prayer, in anticipation, that we need to prepare ourselves. That if we're going to have the boldness to go out on a limb and pray that God would do something for us, that we're going to start in a position of faith, a humility, a sense of humble faith, but faith. And we're going to prepare to God prepare for God to move however he desires to. And so day one is titled, Get Ready. And so ironically, <laughs> though we're taking a break from Acts, we're actually going to be reading from Acts chapter 10. I know there's a sense of humor there. But Acts chapter 10 really sets things up in such an amazing way. Uh, Acts chapter 10, in this section, Peter is preparing to visit a Gentile. After Jesus' resurrection, what we've come to discover is a physical thing took place that had great symbolic meaning. The veil or the curtain in the temple was torn in two. That was a physical demonstration of the power of Jesus and his death, burial, and soon-to-be resurrection. But spiritually, the boundary lines that separated the people of God from the rest of the world were being erased. And that the exclusive God of Israel was no longer to be exclusive to them. And so Jesus, after he resurrected, he meets with his apostles and he tells them to go into all the world, baptizing people in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to be teaching them everything that he's commanded them. And so now the ministry, the, the gospel, Christianity in itself is becoming mobilized beyond the boundary lines of Israel. And this once known exclusive God is not that way anymore. But for the person that we're going to be reading about, though God was exclusive, he was not entirely inaccessible. And so Peter is preparing to go talk to this Gentile who he likely knows nothing about. He only knows name and, and maybe occupation. And so verse 1 and 2 actually tell us everything we need to know about who this person is. It starts like this. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, and, and as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor, and catch, catch this, he prayed regularly to God. We don't know what he prayed for. We don't know uh, what the frequency was. Uh, but what we do know about this Cornelius is that, one, he is not a Jew. He is not an Israelite. He is not one of them. He was outside of this boundary line. However, he had a relationship with God, a pre-existing one. And what we know from this relationship is that he was a devout person, that he was fully committed to the relationship that he had with God. He feared God. It wasn't just this pie-in-the-sky idea that, that his devotion came from a position of reverence. And he did things that you and I would consider righteous actions, righteous deeds, good things. He gave to the poor. And we know his whole house was just like him. That something within him overflowed into the lives of the people nearest him, at least his household. And this is likely because uh, from a position of this devotion, he knew he ought to be an example. And so out of his example, uh, his wife would follow in his footsteps. His children would worship the very same God that he did. It's likely he had servants, and those within his household, too, would do the same things that Cornelius did. What's strange about this whole thing is that a Roman centurion 
would not typically do these things. Romans did not typically worship God. Romans, they, they had a Greek pantheon, and so they did not have a God. They had lots of gods. And from their perspective, all of these gods don't care one bit about them. They don't communicate to them. They don't love them. Uh, to, to this Greek pantheon that's above them, uh, humans were an accident, uh, and they didn't really care. But they had all the power, and so people feared them, but from like a, an actual position of fear that if they do the wrong thing, they are going to be smited. Not so with Cornelius. This was different from him. And so we don't know how Cornelius learned about the one true God. We don't know how Cornelius came to this knowledge of Yahweh, the Lord Most High. But we are told in very few words that based on his knowledge of the divine, he took this discipline and turned it into a practice. That he practically applied this devotion that he had to the one true God and became a disciplined believer. He was devout. He fearfully revered God. He gave to the poor. He led his household, and he prayed regularly to God. If your name appeared in the Bible, what would the next words following it be? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, I mean, if, if we had this book, and you opened it up, and it had your name, not just your name, but you, what would the following words be that would come after it? Some of you, it might start very similar. There once was a man named Nate. There once was a woman named Maxine. There once was a boy named Campbell. There once was a girl named Zoe. And that's all fine, and that's great. But what would the next words be? Maybe it would list where you live, too. Who lived in Fort Wayne. Would the words then say, who was faithful? who was a student of God, who was a student of the word, who was committed to the Lord, who served him, what words would come after your name? Whatever those words are, one of the things that we know is that they could say, who prayed regularly to God. And maybe you do. Maybe you are all of those things. Maybe you are faithful. Maybe you are a student of the word. Maybe you do serve God, and maybe you do pray regularly to God. But if I had to guess, if any of you found yourselves, or maybe even currently find yourselves in the same shoes as CJ did back in 2017, you probably wouldn't insert good, happy, nice words. You would probably look at yourself in a little bit of a different context. And maybe all those positive words would end up being replaced with bad ones. Maybe for you, rather than being hopeful, you would see yourself as hopeless. Maybe for you, rather than being described as faithful, you felt faithless. And maybe for you, rather than being joyful, you were desperate. And all of these negative things you might be applying to yourself because of a position or a circumstance or whatever it is, but... I want you to know the amazing thing that I experienced during my 40-day prayer journey is that regardless of the bad words I would apply to myself and regardless of the bad things you may apply to yourself, God will give you good. I say that with boldness and confidence that, that God will, not God can, not God is able, not God might, but I firmly believe that if we are committed to prayer, if we are regularly praying to God, that God will give you good. And that's because what I know about God is that his word tells us that he gives good and perfect gifts to his children. Uh, Jesus even says it like this, you who are wicked, evil, imperfect people, if you are able to give good gifts to people, how much greater is the perfect Father up above able to give you better gifts than what you could ever imagine as good? God is able to do far more than we could ever imagine. And so I firmly believe 
that if we are beginning this as day one and deciding, I want to be the kind of person who is known as a person who regularly prays to God, whatever those words are that you apply to your life, especially if they are negative things, especially if they are born out of circumstances or doubts or insecurities, I firmly believe that if you are committed to prayer, God will give you good. And so in this prayer journey, you need to prepare yourself for the good that God is going to give you. And you might be wondering, well, what is the good that comes to Cornelius? We know he's a guy who regularly prayed, but certainly there's got to be more to this. There is. And so Peter is, is compelled by God to go and find this person and to meet with him and to sit down with him and to eat with him. Peter is compelled to meet with Cornelius as a mutual Someone who is mutual in faith. Someone who is mutual in stature. Mutual in favor and mercy and grace. And so Peter is instructed to treat Cornelius and his whole household as if they are already part of God's chosen people. Though they are not yet, that he would sit and eat with them. And at first Peter struggled with this. This is what it continues to say. In verse 11 it picks up. And it says, uh, as Peter, it says, he saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then the voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. But Peter declared, no, Lord, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. You see, what you need to know is that there were parts of the law within Israel that would develop and, and display their uniqueness as a nation, as a country, as God's people. And so they had many laws that would exclude Israel from the rest of the world, where the rest of the world has all these arbitrary rules set by mankind. Israel had a very precise set of laws given to them by God. And of these laws, certain ones, when broken, would make a person unclean. That was the term that they typically used. Uh, an appropriate word to use there would also be unholy. Uh, another appropriate word would be common that it's not different anymore, that you're not set apart, you are not holy, you're the same as everyone else. And so when a person would break those laws, they would be called unclean, and they would have to go through a whole process to be clean again. And this was God's way of teaching Israel that they are meant to be separate, they're meant to be holy and set apart for God's divine purpose. And now, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, God's holy divine purpose is to reconcile the entire world to him through the blood of Jesus Christ. It always was. This wasn't plan B. This wasn't a new plan that God is devising. This wasn't some kind of backup plan now that things have changed. This was always God's plan. And it had to be ex executed precisely in this way. Through his blood. And because of this, these unclean, impure things, God has chosen to purify them through the blood of Jesus. Because Jesus' sacrifice, his blood, did something that none of the other sacrifices that Israel has ever been witnessed or treasured or valued uh, or held up in high esteem, none of those sacrifices could ever amount to the sacrifice that Jesus had done. And so for Peter... In this moment, as he's being told to go meet with Cornelius as a mutual, uh, Peter would not look at Cornelius as a mutual, as a sinner in need of God's redemptive grace if he only saw him as a Gentile, if he only saw him as one of those people. And so God is trying to paint a new picture for Peter, that something has changed not in God's plan, but something has changed in God's earth among God's people. And so God gave Peter this vision of animals who were deemed unclean, and that by consuming them, the person would then be made unclean. And then to Peter's reluctance, God replies. He says in verse 15, but the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean 
if God has made it clean. And so the story goes on, and it goes to show that Peter arrives, he meets with Cornelius, and Cornelius falls on his face before this man of God, this holy, reverent person. And in verse 26, it says that Peter picked him up and met him as a mutual, and it says that he pulled him up and said, Stand up, I am a human being just like you. See, Peter's already starting to see him as a mutual. The story then goes on. I told you we were using the Bible today. Verse 30, it says, Cornelius replied. He begins to tell Peter why these events are happening. And he said, four days ago, I was praying in my house about this same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon a Tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Talk about pressure. And so the message Peter gives is the gospel. And to our understanding, this is the first time that the gospel was given to Gentile ears. And Peter doesn't give some short abbreviated version. No, Peter gives him the entire gospel that there, there, there was a man named Jesus. And this Jesus was no ordinary man. He was the son of God and he came down in the flesh and he dwelled among us and he died on the cross at the hands of wicked, evil sinners. But because of his death, Our sins have been forgiven, and this Jesus did not stay dead. He rose again from the grave, and we were eyewitnesses to these things. Peter goes on, and he's telling him the gospel. And verse 44, it's like God interrupts the gospel, which just seems so strange. In verse 44, it says, Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. So why this story? Why would we want to begin our journey, 40 days of prayer, with this story of Cornelius? I think Cornelius' life, his testimony, paints a beautiful picture of the good that God will do for those who faithfully pray, regardless of their background, regardless of their ethnicity, or regardless of borderlines, regardless of upbringing, regardless of tradition. I wholeheartedly believe That regardless of any of our lives, our history, or any of the negative words that we may apply to ourselves, that if we are faithfully going to God in prayer, and that we are committed, and that our heart is in alignment with exactly what God desires from us, I wholeheartedly believe that God will give us good. And the good for Cornelius is something truly remarkable. He and his household received salvation. And it wasn't just him. Though he set an amazing example, it was everyone who was in this close proximity, everyone who lived within his household. The good for Cornelius was something that the rest of Israel had never seen or heard of before. This was the first Gentile to ever be considered a Christian. But it all was because back in Acts chapter 10, verse 2, it told us, He prayed regularly to God. And so those seven years ago, back in 2017, when I was praying, my prayer was simple, but I wanted it to be precise. And so my thoughts, my fears was that if my faith is being chipped away, God, I want to experience your presence genuinely. I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, and I want to experience your presence every day. And so I asked God to to just allow me to feel this this presence. 
and however he wanted to do it, I was fine with. But I asked him that, that he would do so in such a clear way that a distracted, doubtful, insecure CJ would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this indeed was an encounter with God the Father. And as I committed to that prayer, God graced me with exactly what I was asking for every day. That whole 40-day journey, I'm telling you, I have never felt so close to God than I did at that time. Though my faith was way down here, it was like God was willing to open up these floodgates. And I got to experience something, a closeness that prior to that I had never experienced before. And sometimes his experience was felt, it was revealed, sometimes it was just by a song that I would hear. Sometimes it was an unexpected conversation that I would exchange with other people. Sometimes it was just a, a new thing that I discovered just through reading his word, and it became this, this great expression that God is actually revealing himself to me in his word because I asked him to. Sometimes it wasn't any of those things at all, and it was just a feeling in my heart. But for those 40 days, I was genuinely experiencing the presence of God in ways that I never felt before. And so this, this struggling youth pastor those years ago, when I decided, look, God, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I'm just going to commit myself to do the things that, that you have told me to do. And God was so gracious to honor those things. And so my, ask, my question for you is that as you're setting your mind into understanding what is this faith journey, what is this prayer journey, what is it that, that I want to do, I want to simply ask you what is it that for the next 40 days you are going to precisely pray for? Because I think you need to have some kind of target. You can't just climb up on the watchtower and constantly be spinning and, and not knowing what it is that you ought to be looking for. What is that one thing that you want to ask God? Maybe some of you know exactly what it is. Maybe you have had something on your mind or in your heart and you've known, I, I just need to really spend more time dedicated in prayer. Maybe I just need to have this commitment where I'm trusting God is going to hear me. You might know exactly what it is. But maybe day one for you could begin by you just asking God, God, what is it you want me to have? God, what is it you want me to experience? God, what is it you want me to be asking for? It's okay to be uncertain in that regard. But you probably should know that at a certain point, your eyes, your mind, your heart needs to have some kind of target. Because if God is asking you, what do you want me to do? You ought to have an answer for him. In this uh, book, Draw the Circle, we, we get this example of a guy named Pony, and you have to understand that this isn't a story found in the Bible, so we're not going to treat it that way. It's a tradition that's given to young Jewish boys in their rabbinical school. Uh, but they learn about this person named Pony, and Pony was living during a time where there was a severe drought everywhere, and a severe drought means no crops. No crops means no food. No food means everyone is starving. And Honey's fear was that this could very well be the brink of death for an entire generation. And so Honey, in boldness, he drew a circle, and he got inside of that circle, and he boldly lifted his eyes to prayer, and he said, Master of the universe, I will not remove myself from this location until you show mercy on your children and send rain for these crops. And as you learn more about that story, you come to find out that God precisely answers this prayer of Honey. But for us, I would rather take Honey's story and, and make it secondary, make it ancillary, and I would much rather you be equipped with your own story. I would much rather you, at the end of this 40-day journey, tell someone else about the time you drew a circle, about the time you positioned yourself, about a time where you climbed up the watchtower and that you poured your heart in prayer and that you would give it all to God. What is it that you personally would pray for? I think it's important because this is one of the things that very, very rarely do we get a pass to be selfish in this way. You are allowed to pray about your personal life. Lift up to God things about your household, your family, your faith, your finances. I don't know whatever it is, but, but take a moment and spend time and maybe let today be the day one of you targeting something and saying, God, I'm going to go to you in prayer. And I'm going to bring myself to that prayer closet. 
I'm going to bring myself to that dinner table. I'm going to bring myself to that pew. I'm going to bring myself to that small group. I'm going to bring myself to that Sunday school. And, and I am just going to pour my heart out in prayer every day. As a church, this is where our one big ask comes from. Because I want you to know, I want you to pick something personally. But as a church, we have to address something that is a major issue. And you've probably been painfully aware of it. Some of you certainly know, but across the United States, for it's, it's really close to like 30 years. I'm pretty sure the trend is at 28 years now that a study had shown that church attendance has been dwindling 1% every year consistently for nearly thir- three decades. So if you have quick math, that's nearly 30% less people in churches today than 30 years ago. And that is a trend that doesn't seem to be going away soon. And you might not think about it that way, but just look around this room. There's some empty chairs. We, uh, in, our, in our children's class, I've talked to Diane about this, uh, and, and in both sides. So on the side over here in the nursery and the preschool, they used to have so many students in there that they had to come to the, to the fellowship hall as overflow. Not anymore. Uh, in, in the Hope Kids room, they got these pretty colorful chairs. They're really cool. The kids love them. They're like red and green and blue and orange. And, and at some point, we had to pull out the old boring brown chairs because there weren't enough. Not anymore. And it just seems like there's this continual trend within churches, but, but certainly in ours, of more and more empty chairs. And it is isn't our desire to pray to God that, that he would send someone to fill these chairs up to boast of a number, this number, that number, to praise ourselves or to glorify ourselves. No, we recognize as a church, God positioned us here for a very important reason. And if we aren't targeting exactly what that is, there's going to be more and more empty chairs. And we want to be a church that is combating the natural flow of things. We want to be a church that despite the natural progression of the world around us, that God would supernaturally move within our church and within our community. And so we're praying over the empty chair. And as a church, our students, they have empty chairs that they're praying for. And not not just that God would build up their classroom, but because of the people who ought to be sitting in there, that God loves them, that God would wish for us to meet them as mutuals, just as Peter would meet with Cornelius. Uh, The kids in the nursery, they have these little placemats that they kneel on and they're going to be praying. And then they're going home and they're praying about it too. And my ask is that as a church, we would rally behind this idea of praying over the empty chair. Not for our own glorification, but for God. That God would use our church to be a profound blessing in the lives of people around us. And I wholeheartedly believe that as a church, if we begin to pray, if we dedicate this in in 40 days, if we are regularly praying that God would fill these chairs, I wholeheartedly believe that God will do good and that God will honor this prayer. And so as a church, that's exactly what we're doing. And, And personally, I have no idea who is going to fill these chairs. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's your children or your grandchildren. Maybe it's that coworker who's been stubborn, and, and though you worship God, they seem to be the complete opposite. Maybe it's someone who you've never met before. But I believe that God has a way of doing incredible things. And so we're going to spend time praying over the empty chair this morning. And what we want to do is encourage you that throughout the rest of the service, as we're up here worshiping and praising God, that one by one, or maybe you can come as your small group or even as your Sunday school, that you would come up to the chair and understand we're not praying to the chair. The chair isn't some magical thing. We're not praying in some way as if when we draw a circle, there's power there. No, we are just praying to God. And as a nation, that seems to be falling further and further away from our God and Father, that they would be reconciled and come back to him. And for the people in our community, we, we can't imagine a faith there, but I wholeheartedly believe that if we commit ourselves to doing what God desires, I believe he's going to honor us. And so at this time, we're going to begin day one with a bit of faith. Maybe it's, it's the smallest amount of faith that you can muster. Maybe you are someone who has this great depth and wealth of faith that you trust God, and maybe you are the biggest faith mover and shaker in the people around you, and they look up to you. But by faith, we're going to get ready. By faith, 
you're going to start seeing us pulling out more of those empty chairs. By faith, we're going to start drawing some circles. And by faith, we are going to expect God to move. By faith, we are going to believe that God will give us good. And in return, I believe that in faith, we are going to bring great glory and honor to God as his children who are called by his name would return to him in prayer. And so I'm going to lead us by praying first. And I would ask that you pray with me. Heavenly Father, we know that there are amazing things you are able to do. We know that you are able to do greater than we can ever ask or imagine. And when we look at these chairs in our room, it's not that hard for us to count them. And so, God, I pray that you do greater than that. I pray that you'd blow away our expectations, but not that we would receive glory, Lord. We pray this, that you would receive glory, that you would receive all the honor and praise, and that more people would come to receive this gospel, that more people would come to a spiritual, eternal, life-saving faith in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray that this church be the watchtower, that this church be the bastion, that this church be the place that as people come to, I pray that they meet Jesus here. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my
This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe, Jesus. Your holy presence living in me. You are my daily bread. You are my daily bread. We need you, Lord. You are my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. We're desperate. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the
going to call the worship team back up for one last song. And while they're doing that, uh, the series is seven weeks. And so on Sunday, May 19th is our seventh week. And we're planning to hold a prayer and praise night that evening. So May 19th, 6 p.m. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. I'm hoping to have people give testimony of how God has moved in their lives in that seven weeks. So we hope to join you join us then. I'm going to have you stand if you're able.
Thank you so much for being here this morning. Have a wonderful week and go in peace.